next person up um, on the on the uh, show tonight um, is uh, Rick Helfenbein. And Rick, hopefully I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, but uh, he's going to cover looking forward um, with the politics of global trade, um, a bit of a big picture item. Good to see you, Rick. Yeah, thank you, Joshua. And thank you for kicking it off with uh, what problems <laughs> is everybody trying to, uh, to solve? Because uh, part of what I'm going to do today is tell you what some of the problems are from a more global um, perspective. So I, I genuinely appreciate the opportunity. And as Joshua said, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you everywhere. And uh, my role in this, and again, thank you to uh, Janice and the team for giving me the opportunity, is to give you a global picture of everything that's going on that could affect your business. And uh, that's where we'll go with this. So starting with uh, my first slide, I, I think it's always appropriate when someone's speaking to you, they give you um, a little background of uh, who they are and what they are. Uh, I have been in the OEM business for 16 years. I was the USA president for a publicly listed company in Hong Kong called Luentire in the USA uh, part of it. And I'm very, very familiar with manufacturing all around the world. I also ran several apparel companies and actually did launch uh, uh, I was very instrumental in launching a label many years ago that some of you may know called La Tigre. Um, with all that experience, I then went to Washington and uh, was the former uh, chairman of the board of the American Apparel and Footwear Association. I did that and then they uh, had me as their president and CEO and I did that for four years. So today I'm a consultant. I give uh, commentary and I try and help everybody understand the problems of our industry as best I can. So let's, let's get into it. The, the global business of your company, of what you do every day, is deeply affected by a lot of things. And many of you do business with the United States or are affected by business uh, in the United States. And frankly, since President uh, Biden came in, the USA trade deals, we, we haven't done any. Not only have we not done any, many have uh, been in limbo or shall we say in temporary expiration mode. There's something called the generalized system of preferences that wasn't renewed by Congress along with miscellaneous tariff bills. All these affect things that we trade. The African Growth and Opportunity Act uh, is due for renewal in 2025, but is kind of stalled uh, because there was civil strife um, in Ethiopia and the U.S. pulled their benefits, and that was a big manufacturing company. There are issues in Nicaragua. There are issues uh, in Haiti. There are issues in Myanmar, Burma. These are all trouble spots around the world. And then, of course, everyone is trying to figure out how to deal with the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act because goods are being stopped at the border coming into the United States. Then locally, just to add some excitement, we have some things going on called the New York Fashion Act, which has been proposed. And on the federal level, something called the Fabric Act, which has been proposed. And then there's something that you'll be familiar with called de minimis that is affecting uh, how everyone does direct to consumers. So these are the big picture things. And I will ask you again, much like Joshua asked you, how does this affect your daily job? So we're going to go to the next slide and do uh, a little bit of a uh, couple of past years of review. So you can see to where and how we got to today. Now, the year of 2020, everybody painfully remembers, was the year of COVID. By March of 2020, everybody was well aware that COVID was going to be a problem that was going to affect our industry. It was not a good year for our industry. There were more bankruptcies than we had seen in 10 years, and they weren't just little bankruptcies. Big names, J.C. Penney, J. Crew, Brooks Brothers, Neiman Marcus. We had the most shopping mall vacancies in 20 
years. Loan defaults were very high. Consumer products were being tariffed. That was a carryover from the Trump administration. So cost and prices started to rise. And the supply chain became a problem. Now let's morph into 2021, the next slide. Uh, retail, much to everybody's surprise, came roaring back uh, to the tune of almost four and a half trillion dollars in the United States. E-commerce sales absolutely exploded, hit about 19% of total sales. The bankruptcy process, which we had all feared in 2020, turned out to be shorter than expected. And many of the companies that went into bankruptcy came out better for it, if you will. Uh, they emerged healthier. Um, money was not being spent in 2020 because people weren't dining out. They weren't going on vacation. So what happened? They went and spent it on apparel and accessories and footwear. However, with all this going on, inflation um, raised its ugly head, became the highest it had been in 40 years. Our trade deficit mushroom. There were still COVID issues in 2021 and supply chain issues that everyone was painfully aware of. So now let's go to 2022. We're catching up real fast here. Um, retail continued to grow. Grow, we grew about 7%, um, according to the NRF. Uh, E-commerce sales now started to flatten out a bit. They became about 15% of overall sale. We started to hear about a company called Shein and uh, De Minimis, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, but that has to do with direct to consumer. New store openings during that period finally started to outpace closing, uh, closing of stores and um, inflation continued to be bad. Our trade deficit in the US, that means that imports uh, coming in were higher than exports going out, was the highest it had ever been. West Coast ports were threatened with strike and slowdown. A rail strike was pending, but eventually uh, was stopped. So 2022 was a good year of mixed bands sort of return. So where are we now? We're in 2023. What's going on? Inflation has slowed down. Sheehan and Timu, another new name for you, uh, are now subjects du jour in the direct to consumer market. And again, I will talk about this a little later. Uh, Canada was having a strike issues at their ports that got repaired. And lo and behold, for those of us who love the supply chain, there's always something going on. The Panama Canal started running low on water. And even today, there's about a 20 day wait approximately to get through the canal. Uh, e commerce sales had leveled off. Uh, US square footage of retail um, sort of had settled down. And retail this year, everyone's changing their predictions pretty much daily. We're looking at somewhere between 4 and 6%, according to the NRF. There are many naysayers who say it'll come in at 3%. Anyway, we're looking at what is probably flat to slightly up. And going into the holiday season, as many of you are painfully aware, inventory is low. So if we get a burst of sales, it's going to be hard to sell things that you don't have. And that's where we are. So now going to the next slide, uh, you have to look at the big picture. The big picture. Is this sourcing? Is it politics or is it a combination of both? And that's what I'm trying to do with this presentation is make everyone globally aware of things that are going on that affect your day-to-day -day business. So President Biden unfortunately continued the China tariffs that were put in place by President Trump. We thought they would go away, they have not gone away. Public opinion, against China really, unfortunately, had turned negative. Uh, only about 15% of Americans polled in a recent Gallup poll viewed China favorably. And frankly, for all of us who do business in China, that's something that needs to be <laughs> changed or improved. Um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, uh, 
uh, was put into law in December of 2021, but actually put into effect in June of 2022. This is a problem uh, for those of us in the industry because you have to be much more careful about your supply chain. Um, to date, we've detained $1.7 billion at the port. So, you know, if anyone's connected, um, you know, with that part of our business from the SAR region of China or cotton, uh, you, you have to be concerned that your goods will be held up at the border and you have to figure that you have to do something else where you could get caught. Uh, in terms of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, President Biden pulled the plug on Ethiopia because there was civil strife in Ethiopia. When they did that, a lot of people lost confidence in the African Growth and Opportunity Act. So if you were going to leave China, per se, to go somewhere else, where are you going to go? Maybe Africa was a thought, and then maybe you slowed down that thought. Hard to say. Again, problems in Myanmar, Burma, Haiti, Nicaragua. Uh, these are all problem issues. Um, there were the strikes. And, you know, as everybody saw, uh, this uh, government is very favorable towards uh, labor and towards strikes. And that's now become part of our business. So um, there are no U.S. trade deals on the horizon. And then there's also China has become part of uh, RCEP and the CPTPP, the former USA um, TPP program uh, that has started without the United States. The United States is not involved in RCEP. It's not involved in CPTPP. So again, are these politics? Is this sourcing? Does this tell you what to do next? So let's go to the next slide, which asks you a question, much like Joshua did. Um, these are challenges. So those of you thinking of all the problem spots in the world probably would have wanted to change your sourcing matrix, right? Well, let's see what the data shows. Let's go to the next slide. This is of all the slides I'm going to show you in. I, there's only about eight or nine minutes left in um, my presentation. This slide here is the most important. Take a look at the two red arrows, the two red arrows, and they tell you very, very clearly what's been going on. You know what's been going on? Nothing has been going on. If you look at the top two countries for the last two and a half years, China and Vietnam, have about a 52% market share. So two countries, 52%. You go to five countries, uh, you're, you're in the high 60s, 69% of where all goods come from. This is the United States data. And 10 countries is 80%, more than 80% actually. So when you're looking at your sourcing matrix, which hasn't changed that much, uh, you have to think, where am I going to source? How am I going to source? What countries are in the top 10? And you look at it and say, oh my goodness, this is where I can go. This is what's going on. This is where the market is. So next slide. Uh, again, I wanted to go over issues by country. In Burma, as everyone knows, there was a military coup. In Ethiopia, there were issues in the north of the country and the south. In the north, there's a group called the Tigres, and there was uh, essentially a civil war. Uh, the United States uh, countered by pulling away the AGOA benefits. A lot of um, manufacturing for apparel particularly was going on in the south of Ethiopia. Um, this was... Uh, shall we say, painful for the industry. You know, some people would say it absolutely had to be done. Some people would say, well, the strife was in the north. Um, why'd, you, why'd you affect the factories in the south? So this has been problematic as, quote, an alternative to winter source. In Cambodia, there's always questions and issues, but Cambodia seems to muddle through them. In Nicaragua, the uh, again, uh, the Ortega regime has... Uh, has been making it, let's just say, uncomfortable for doing uh, business down there, but business continues to go on. And in Haiti, unfortunately, um, 
weak governance uh, has made it a difficult place to do business. So then you go to, you know, where other places do you potentially do business? There's a trade arrangement called CAF to DR. Uh, it's actually doing reasonably well. Problem with CAF to DR is, you know, uh, you try and get different fabrics. Uh, it's difficult sometimes. A lot of the factories want large runs. Um, it's a great place to do business, uh, but always not as flexible or as easy as, if you will, doing business in China or in Asia. So you go to the um, new agreements, RISA. RISA has 15 countries in it, and China is the most notable, clearly, the 10 ASEAN countries plus five other countries. Um, USA is not part of RISA, the Regional Comprehensive Economic partnership. Then there was TPP. Everyone remembers this from President Obama. Well, we pulled out, the United States pulled out, but uh, the pact goes on. They changed the name to, some people call it TPP-11 or CPTPP. Um, it covers 18% of the GDP. China has applied to join CPTPP, and uh, the UK is, is also uh, in the wings. And in RCEP, you're looking at 30% of the world's GDP, GDP and uh, TPP 11, you're looking at 18% in the United States is not part of either of them. That's a bit of a problem. Um, India has uh, improved relations with the United States on a number of levels, particularly as related to trade. They lost GSP under um, President Trump, they're liable to get it back. So you have to ask yourself, with all this background, what countries and politics are you looking at for 2024? Global dynamics are clearly linked to your job, to what you do every day. Next slide. Uh, another thing, and probably the uh, last big thing I will explain uh, with you before I close is something called Section 321 de minimis. What de minimis was, and it's been around for years and years and years, I think since the 1930s, was when an American tourist went abroad and they came back and they had to go through customs, they were allowed $200 per person per day. And uh, it was just fine. And it worked just fine. Well, during COVID, um, well, actually prior to COVID, President Obama raised the level to $800 per person per day in March of 2016. Then COVID hit, and a lot of very enterprising people realized that you could now ship, because the way the law was written, up to $800 per person per day direct to the consumer from outside the country, and because of the way the de minimis rule is written, it is free of any duty, it is free of any tariff, and it's not subject to the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. So a company like Sheehan in May of 2021 suddenly became the most downloaded app in the United States. And you can check all this, there's a way to do it on the internet, it's called, uh, used to call uh, App Annie, now it's called Data AI, and it tells you the downloads every week. She and Rose through the sky, they had a different business model, very, very clever, and they could go direct to consumer, and people loved it in the United States. Um, in the Super Bowl last year, a company called Timo arrived with two 30-second commercials, and suddenly Timo became the number one most downloaded app, doing pretty much the same thing as Shein, but more diverse product. And Timo is part of PDD, Pindadao, Pin, I can never say that right, I'll go with PDD, formerly of Shanghai now of, I think, uh, Dublin, and by the way, Xi'an has moved from China to Singapore, so they are not considered, quote, um, companies uh, from that location, if you will. However, 
they are doing still doing business and American government is extremely concerned and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. They could possibly go as far as to block direct to consumer from China. Um, nobody's quite sure, but it is most definitely on the agenda as something that is a different way of doing business that perhaps skirts the way we probably should be doing business and it's something you should all be aware of. But Sheehan and Timu have clearly uh, displayed retail brilliance in the United States. And now finally, um, my last slide, just basically tells you um, that your job is much bigger than just what you do each and every day. Um, there's an old saying in our industry, some say that the famous five pocket gene uh, was four pockets for you and one for the government. Not really true, but it just sounds great because the government is involved in your business, whether it's politics, laws, it affects how you source, it affects what you do every day, it affects how we look at the environment and sustainability, every aspect of our business. So what you have to do as an individual is not only pay attention to your day-to-day -day job, you have to be aware of all of these global dynamics that go on well beyond what you do. Because your future and your brand and your company depend on you being very well informed. So thank you very much for uh, letting me spend some time with you. And uh, as I say, change is happening every day. That was really great, Rick. We really appreciate uh, that overview. I, I don't think we realize how much um, politics really affect what we do. Is there is there any reason? I mean, you know, seventy percent of over seventy percent of products coming from Asia um, for the U.S. for U.S. apparel imports. How come we don't see more um, North America, Central America um, uh, imports? Why why haven't we developed that market? It seems like that would really help speed the market. Well, there's, there's a rapid push to develop that market. The idea of nearshoring or, if you will, friendshoring. Uh, is well on the agenda, but anyone who has done extensive business down there realizes that in our uh, fashion model, if you will, we're always trying to get what the consumer wants. It's not as flexible as the model from Asia. From Asia, you can often turn very quickly, make fashionable product very, very quickly, and it doesn't work as easily uh, in Caf de DR or Mexico. It's better suited for longer runs. When it becomes more flexible, maybe you'll see a change. Okay, well, that's, that's great. Really appreciate your time. Um, uh, and uh, thank you very much for giving us, uh, giving us uh, that overview. Appreciate it. Thank you all. all right. Take care.